All right. Today we, we're, uh, we're getting toward the end of our discussion on the Lord's Church, and I think we don't have probably any more than maybe a couple of weeks, a couple of three weeks uh, on this. Let me finish it today. I don't know. But I uh, want to kind of summarize some things that we have looked at, and then I uh, kind of want to close. I found uh, two things online that I shared with you related to the purpose of the church, and so I want you all to kind of think about that. So I'm going to ask you, okay, we've looked at all these things. What is the purpose of the church? And I want to close with a few thoughts on that, and again, I want to open that up to y'all, too, as we discuss that. So as we near the, the end of this study, let's consider some of the things we've talked about over the last few weeks. As we study what Christ did for us upon the cross to make salvation possible. And I don't think you can talk too much about that. Uh, how, do you, how do you put in the words what Jesus did for us? How do you put in words his love for us? That's a topic we need to discuss often. We looked at what man is commanded to do to get into Christ in order to be washed from our sins in his precious blood. To gain access to that blood. How do we avoid that? How do we get into Christ? So how does that happen? So we spent a lot of time talking about that. We've looked at the biblical pattern for worship in the church and the five elements of Christian worship. Uh, we've looked at the organization of the leadership of the church. How, how, is, how is the church organized? Uh, we've looked at how Christians are expected to live. And again, in closing, as I said, we want to uh, look for a little bit at the purpose of the church. Why is the church here? Why is it in existence? What are we to do? And so uh, the first PowerPoint I found, and I did not, I wish I, when I had uh, found it, I had written down what the congregation was, and I did not. There was a congregation somewhere out west, and I uh, made some points about it that I want to share with you, that uh, again, you can chime in on, on what you think about what he said. And then um, I asked my college roommate, David Sargent, he's the preacher of the Creekwood Church of Christ, uh, if he had any material, and he sent me a PowerPoint, and I put some of that into this presentation, let you see some things that uh, Brother David came up with on this topic, too. Uh, so here's, here's the first one, and again, this is a, a congregation out west, and again, I can't remember where it was. So the first point this individual made, have you paused to consider why the church exists? It's a pretty important question. Why do we exist? It appears to me, the person that wrote this, I don't remember who it was now, that a good number of the problems faced by congregations stem from a lack of understanding of the purpose of the church. It says, I looked at material from various denominations, and here's what some of the denominations say for the purpose of the church. It says, one, after getting a number of things right, declared that it was a duty of the church to care for orphans and widows based on James 1.27. Thus they concluded the church exists to care for the needy. Uh, two, and they declared that the church exists exist to give glory to God. Other words, such evangelism are just minor side issues. Three, yet another says the purpose is to edify its members. But another said, and uh, here's a quote from this that he uh, found, if a fraction of the money that is spent on new church buildings was spent on helping the poor, the elderly, the widows, orphans, drug addicts, and the homeless, there would be no need for community outreach programs to do the job the church should be doing. Reading, studying, and talking about the Bible is all well and good, but without active work of works of charity, it is all vanity. A church needs to reach out and help the poor and needy in their community, not sit in their plush pews once a week and pat themselves on the back for having the nicest building in town. What is the purpose of having a church if it is not to provide a place of help, rest, resources, and hope for those who are hurting, suffering, addicted, and at their wit's end? Five, it is clear to me that many view their churches as societal clubs, which caters to the wants of its members, thus providing gyms, fitness centers, daycare, and other services. So, uh, again, it is true that a lot of people misuse the church and, and aren't connected to the real reason why they exist. So this mixed view of the church affects us as well. We end up losing sight of why Christ built his church. So two, before we can define what, uh, before we can establish the purpose of the church, let's define what the church is. We've talked about that some already. Uh, it says, uh, hey, some of the misconceptions regarding the church comes from a very loose co concept of exactly what the church is. It is called by a variety of names. Most translations use the word church uh, translate, uh, to translate the Greek word ekklesia. That word simply means the assembly, or a group of people who come together to meet. 
A, the English word church actually derives from a different Greek word, kerakos, which means belonging to the Lord. But that word has come to apply to the assembly that belongs to the Lord. B, that's why the church is sometimes referred to as the called out, 1 Peter 2, 9. This is the assembly of people called out of sin and into salvation. Two, it is referred to as a kingdom, Colossians 1, 13 and 14. This emphasizes that Christ is our king, our Lord, Ephesians 1, 19 through 23. And we are citizens in that kingdom, Ephesians 2, 19. It is a body, Colossians 1, 18, we talked about that. And the emphasis here is that Christ is in control and is most important. B, we are members, each unique, fulfilling different roles, but at the same time working in harmony, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14. The church is a household, 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. God is the father of the house, Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. Christ the firstborn son, Romans 8, 29. We are God's children. We will receive an inheritance, Romans 8, 16 and 17. So, uh, again, this, uh, continue that same thing. It is spoken of as all the saints of all the times throughout the world, Hebrews 12, 23. And it can be applied to an assembly of Christians in a given location, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. But the individual Christian is not a church. Again, we talked about that before. We make up the church. We're part of the church. Uh, Luke 17, 20 and 21 says the church within us. We say, well, we're, each of us are a stone in that building. But uh, he says, it, um, he, the individual, is only part of the church. The church itself is something different from the individual. One, seen any difference in handling problems, Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Uh, two, seen any difference in handling the needy, 1 Timothy 5, 16. Many of the mistakes concerning the purpose of the church is seen when people apply an individual's duty to the church's duty. So, uh, again, make a distinction there. Um, somebody's getting over my head a little bit. Uh, three, why the church was established, Matthew 16, 18, uh, when Jesus promised that uh, upon the confession that Peter made, he would build the church. Uh, one, the kingdom of death, Hades, is portrayed as the besieged city. Two, this the world under the sway of Satan. Three, the gates of this world cannot keep the church out. B, thus the purpose of the church is to break through the defenses of the world and to conquer, Revelation 12, 11, uh, 10, 11. C, that's why you see imagery of warfare being used, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. One, when we defend ourselves from the attacks of the enemy, we're not the defenders, but the attackers. I do like that point. I do like that particular point. And uh, sometimes we talk about that in, in football. You can't play defense all the time. There's a part of it, but you got to go on the attack sometimes. And I think that is a good point he makes. Sometimes we in the church, we're always on the defensive. But we're always answering other people's attack rather than going on the attack. I do like that point. Uh, Charlie, you had uh, something you wanted to add. All right, Mark 10 and 15 says, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not end the king. Good point, Charlie. All right, two. The enemy is trying to take us down to keep us from making inroads into what he considers to be his territory. Uh, three, that is why we have to remain on alert. First Thessalonians 5, 6 through 8. Uh, four, we have to always be ready. Romans 13, 11, and 14. Five, prepared for a hard life. 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. And Paul said uh, in what is it, 2 Timothy 3, 12, that all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So that's a part of living the Christian life. Uh, D, we can see this in the first century. Uh, e, sadly, this individual says, I see many doing all they can to avoid battle. They don't want to engage the enemy, 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 14. So we do want to engage the enemy. We do want to be on the offensive when it comes to uh, teaching the word. Four, the church exists to uphold the truth, 1 Timothy 3, 15. It uh, is the foundation which truth puts on display, uh, the church. So we are the, uh, we're the guardians of the truth, if you will. 
a B. Much of the work of the church revolves around this. Its purpose is to make God's wisdom known, Ephesians 3, 10 through 11. One, it spreads the truth, 1 Thessalonians 1, 8. Two, victory in spreading knowledge, 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17. Uh, three, they were so effective that it was spread to all the world, Colossians 1, 5, and 6. C, uh, the church gives financial support to Christians dedicated to teaching the truth, Philippians 4, 15 through 17, and 2 Corinthians 11, verse 8. D. Uh, the church teaches its members so that they are grounded in the truth, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. One, each of the duties given by Christ is geared toward this end. Two, too often people view elders as people who run the church, but they miss the purpose, Acts 20, 28. A, it is the idea of feeding through shepherding, seeing that they have the right pastures available, protecting the sheep from harm, keeping sheep from wandering off into danger, etc. And we've talked about the, the purposes of the eldership uh, before. Uh, B, what most people want elders to do is specifically forbidden, he says, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, I'm not sure what he has in mind there. Uh, three, the goal of teaching is to pass it on, 2 Timothy 2, 2. Two is a talk religion. We talk, uh, we talk about that. Uh, Paul says, I have uh, taught others who will teach others also. Um, four, the grounding is necessary for the spreading. Colossians 1 and verse 2. Everything geared to building Christians up, 2 Corinthians 12, 19. Authority to teach, 2 Corinthians 10, 8, and 13, 10. Uh, e, back in the days of spiritual gifts, prophecy, the teaching of God's thoughts, was more important than speaking in another language, 1 Corinthians 14. Two through four. Uh, one, two uh, tongues were only useful if they promoted learning. First Corinthians fourteen five through six. If in its worship the focus is teaching, one understanding is essential. First Corinthians fourteen fourteen through nineteen. Two, when we assemble, it is for the purpose of edification. First Corinthians fourteen twenty six. Three, it is shown for example in Psalms, Ephesians five seventeen through nineteen, and Colossians three sixteen. Four, that is why the assemblies are so important. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. But the church is not. Uh, it is not here for entertainment. I think we'd all agree with that point. Uh, it's not a social club. I think we'd all agree with that. It is not here to relieve world hunger or eliminate poverty, necessarily. Uh, six, why are we here? What is our purpose as a church? Uh, a, if we don't keep our duty in mind, we will lose the battle. B, you know, if the church got back to its business, one, we would be exposing false religions with a fervor that would make neighbors sit up and take notice. Two, the number of studies and baptisms would dramatically rise. Three, there'd be less grumbling and finger pointing because we'd be too busy. Four, there'd be more unity and harmony as we pull together to support each other in the work. So I think that individual made some good points. I, I, whoever this was is coming from a, a very conservative uh, background, but I think that it did make some good points uh, in that as well. We all have some things, some comments about that before we get into David Sargent's uh, PowerPoint, Charlie. All right, in Matthew 5, 45, it says, it says that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven, for he maketh their son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sinneth rain on the just and the unjust. Yeah, my little matter in the end, child has been a faithful child of God. All right, any other question before we move on? No comments. Uh, this was from David Sargent, <clears throat> looking at the date uh, here, this was about a month before COVID hit, uh, so I did not go to this particular uh, series, I wish I had, but uh, here's some things that Brother David said. I don't know who the quote is from, but it says, Sir, I've not impressed you with the greatness of my cause, and, and our cause in the church. There's not a greater cause on the planet than our cause, for the reasons why we're here. The work of the church is the greatest work on earth. I think we'd all agree with that. Nothing. You know, we can get uh, caught up in uh, George being an over so whatever the situation may be. But we, we find interest and in, in enjoyment in that. But that's not why we're here. As a quote from Matt Layton, I'm not sure that it is, the consuming passion of the first Christians was to build the, uh, that body of Jesus where they lived and serve into a powerful instrument of outreach, edification, and compassion. So number one, God's purpose is for his church, to glorify God in Christ Jesus. A, to preach, teach the gospel. 
Matthew 20, 18 through 20, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and will with you always, even to the end of the age. We have no greater job or duty or purpose in the church than this. Teaching the lost and teaching one another. Uh, B, part of that, the verse 20 from Matthew 28, teaching the same. So we want to teach the lost, or bring as many as we can in, but we'll keep teaching the saved also. Uh, Galatians 4.19, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. So uh, here it's talking about Paul with the Galatians, and we've talked about, we studied Galatians uh, several weeks ago now, a couple of months ago, I guess now, maybe several months ago now. But we talked about uh, Galatians, and, and Paul says, I want to keep working until Christ is formed in you. So, uh, and we talked about that, how they had fallen away and then some error and all this, but I'm trying to cause Christ to grow in you. I see, caring for the poor and needy. Question 6 and verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us, good to, uh, let us do good to all. And the King James says, All men, but that's italicized. I think there's probably a better translation here. Let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith, especially to the brethren. But if we have opportunity to do good to anybody, we should. Uh, God's vision for his church, a, a growing family. He wants us to grow individually and collectively, to mature as a child of God. We want to grow in our love for one another, John 13, 34, and 35. And uh, we discussed that passage in connection with John 17. I told you Franklin Camp had one of the best sermons I've ever heard on that when it connected unity to love. And uh, again, a great message. We want to grow in Christ's likeness, be more like Christ. We want to grow in number, obviously. We would love to see our numbers grow. B, how does that happen? Every member of minister, I think that's a great point. Everyone is a minister. When you uh, look, for instance, and Dad talked about this I guess, several weeks ago now, but when you look at uh, Acts 8, when persecution, when the church was persecuted, it says the maybe that were scattered went over with preaching the word. So if we really want the church to grow, all of us, all of us play a role in that as a minister and as a teacher of the gospel. We all have talents and abilities, First Peter 4, 10, 11, and all of us have different talents and abilities. We talked about that just a, a couple weeks ago, First Corinthians 12. We talked about the, the eye versus the ear, the foot versus the hand. We have different jobs, but they are all very, very important. We must work together, First Corinthians 12. And I've seen, I've seen uh, educators use this before, a uh, team, uh, an acronym there, Together Everyone Achieves More. And they use their Ephesians 4. So all of us working together. Amazing what we get. I've heard uh, my dad talk about this when it comes to uh, athletic teams. It's amazing how much uh, an organization, a team can accomplish if nobody cares who gets the credit. And uh, that, that's true in the church, too. It's, and I've, I, I told y'all, I've heard that but say many, many times, it's not about, it's not about us. It's not about me. It's about we. It's about what we can accomplish collectively. I uh, see serving our community, reaching out to our community. Uh, Acts two forty seven uh, talks about the uh, the church growing uh, there in that passage. No, more numbers being added uh, to the church. I uh, would be salt and light. Matthew five thirteen through sixteen. Uh, that's the theme at Snow Christian this year. I want to encourage the kids to be salt and be light. Uh, follow the example of, of Christ. B a deep love and respect for God's word. The word should be proclaimed from the pulpit. Second. Timothy 4 and verse 2, in season and out of season. I was taught in the classroom, 2 Timothy uh, 2 2, teaching others who then will teach others. Uh, it's to be read, studied, and lived throughout the week. James 1 21 through 25. A quote from uh, George Mueller says, The vigor of our spiritual life would be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our life and thoughts. First Thessalonians 2.13 says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God which you heard from us, you welcome it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. 
E, God's vision for the church, a deep investment in the next generation. I think that's important. Uh, again, going back to 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, we teach it to others who then teach others. And Jesus had a, uh, a quote from the Old Testament, I forgot what it was now, that says, uh, quote, it says, they shall all be taught by God. But it has to be taught. It has to be taught. I think that's why the deep bars come in based this teaching the school and there's missionary work down there in the Philippines over yes. there, teaching teaching others so that they can go out yes. and, and teach others. I read his book uh, a couple years ago whenever he came and it, it, just some outstanding points that he made and I thought one of the points I guess he made this in the pulpit but in, in that book also that sometimes when we go and do mission work we want to have tendency to want to Americanize the people we're going to and so just let them be whoever they are and let, as you say, let them uh, uh, take the responsibility and the ownership of, of what's going there in the church. And, and that's a great point. Because if it's tied to an American missionary, well, that missionary stops coming. And where does the church fall apart? So you want them to be able to stand on their own. And that's a great point. A great point. Uh, Charlie. Well, in Matthew 14, 28, they said, Ye have heard. Now I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you, if you love me, ye would rejoice, because I said, go unto my Father, for my Father is greater than I. Well, verse 15 says, beloved, me keep my commandments. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Brother Dumar talks all the time about the uh, the work in the Philippines, that Philippine school, and, and those missionaries getting ready to go into China. Now, I'd love at some point, it'd be just fun to see what would happen if, if the walls do fall in China, what, what that group would do, you know, but that good point. Uh, so Brother David said, an active youth ministry, uh, so whatever that looks like, uh, but make sure we, we want to teach our young people. Uh, many, all of you in this room have played a part in that uh, over the years. I uh, teach our children, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Uh, he talked about the last leaders program and, and so forth. But how we do that, uh, teaching our kids. I know Brother Donald for years used to take our kids to the Bible Bowl. And that was a, a great program and a big thing, getting them involved in that. So whatever that looks like is a good thing. So the work of the church is worth the strong investment of our time, our talents, and our treasures. It is the greatest work on earth. And so, I want to just, again, taking that and some things we've talked about, and if y'all think of something else, please, I don't consider this to be a, a, a complete list, but some things that came to my mind if we think about what's the purpose of the church. Number one, I don't think there's a greater mission that we have than this. Teach the gospel to every creature. Evangelization. I want to help the lost to come to Christ. Matthew 28, 19, uh, Mark 16, 15, and 16, uh, Luke 24, 46, and 47. There's no greater mission that we have than to teach those who are not Christians. Uh, the next one I put, teach and encourage all the members of the body. So go from evangelization, uh, evangel evangelization to edification, if I can say the word. Uh, edification. So Matthew 20, 20, one of the last things he said there. And teach them, teach the ones you baptize to observe all things I've commanded you. And so that's a, an extremely important work. So teach them all else, but then as one of the, uh, one of the points in that other PowerPoint said, teach them the saved. So that's something we want to continually to uh, continue to do. But we don't, somebody's not converted and then we forget about them. I've heard some of y'all talk about that before, how important it is to uh, stay attached and connected uh, to those individuals. Uh, three, I put to defend, guard, and protect the truth. Uh, Proverbs 23, 23, which says, buy the truth and sell it not. Uh, John 8, 32, Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Uh, John 17, 17, he said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So God's word is truth. I uh, praise and glorify God by worshiping, worshiping Him in spirit and the truth. In the passage we looked at uh, several weeks ago, John 4, 23 and 24, which says, God is the spirit, they that worship Him, must worship Him in spirit and truth. And Charlie, I'll get you in a minute uh, when I finish this, this point here. Uh, live like and for Christ. Live like and for Christ. We are to be an example anywhere we go. And I've made this point with y'all before. 
there's nothing wrong with wearing a t-shirt with a Bible verse on. I think that's great. Uh, in the Old Testament, we're told to write scriptures on our house and everything else. But people should be able to see something different in us, whether we are wearing a certain attire or not. It shouldn't take long. If, if we are right with God, people should see something different in us, uh, the way that we speak, uh, the way we act to people, just the way we conduct our lives. So we ought to see uh, Christ living in us, and that we are following in his footsteps, First Peter 2. 21. And I put, be good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. So our first priority is to those within the church. If we have an opportunity to help others, an uh, opportunity presents itself, certainly we should. Uh, but benevolence, Galatians 6, 9 through 10. And that's what I've got on my list. Y'all have any that y'all want to add uh, to that? Or any comments y'all want to make on that? I think when you start out those first two points, I think it's, uh, I think it's Robert Martin and uh, used, I think he used three E's, evangelize, edify, and equip, I think is, if I remember, and of course, you've got that in there, uh, the, the equipping part, where they would go and teach others, and that, that would involve defending them, guarding, protecting the truth, and in other words, equipping them for every good work, whatever that uh, that work would be. So he used that. I, I think he, if, if I remember correctly, he, I, I get the, the bullet there, Mark. But I think it's when he was here, he would talk about the purpose, what he was doing as a missionary, or what he felt his mission was as a, you know, a representative of those who tried to help him to, to spread the gospel. Is to evangelize, want to evangelize, like you said, teach the gospel to everybody that you can edify the members and equip them to go out and be able to defend the truth, live, live right, do right, and so forth. And that, that would evolve according to evidence, which I think is, is one of the things we need to do as well, is, uh, is, is we, we pray that we'll be able to help those that are in need and so forth and so on. Not just that we study the book of James, not just that we want to build right. back to do right. Do what needs to be done. You know, that's what I guess is, I think you mentioned it back. Was it first John three, seventeen and eighteen? It says love not in yeah. what does it say? Love not in, in word, but in deed and in truth. Yeah. So, yeah. Good point. Right, Charlie. John six thirty five it says and Jesus said unto them. I am the bread of life. He that come unto me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Good one. And uh, there's another passage there in John, I forget where it is now. It talks about the fields being right in the harvest, uh, praying that God will send more laborers. And again, that's where all of us uh, fit a need there. All right, any other thoughts, questions, comments on any of that before we leave that topic? If you boil it down, it'd be teaching the gospel, and it right. involves all those things you mentioned, but uh, basically teaching the gospel to the preacher. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well said. Anyone else? All right. Well, believe it or not, that concludes that particular PowerPoint. We finally made it through that. Okay. We got a few minutes this morning, and we'll get started uh, looking at some of the different uh, churches um, out in our society, uh, out in the world, and in our community. And uh, again, looking at what they say in their own words and comparing that to God's word. Uh, by the time I mentioned the, uh, the book, and I used that in some of this uh, presentation I got here by Alvin Jennings, uh, uh, Traditions of Men versus the Word of God. Uh, so I borrowed heavily on that. There's another one that uh, Brother Joel had given me several years ago uh, called The Eternal Kingdom. And I think uh, Stephen Underwood was studying that in his class. I've seen a couple of copies laying in that room as you come in the door. But that's uh, another very good book. What I want to try to do, uh, I put their subtitle, A History of Departure from the New Testament Pattern. And so, I uh, hope y'all won't get bored with some of the history here at the beginning, but I want to uh, kind of look at some things related to, the kind of, we studied the first century church, but in the years after the first century church, kind of study some things that happened there, 
I'll try to go as quickly as I can through that, and then we'll get to uh, some some teachings in the Catholic Church and comparing that uh, to God's Word. All right, so our objective is to study the history of the Church after the Apostolic Age and gradual, gradual changes in doctrine. By the end of the first century, the church is thought to have been made up of a half a million members scattered around the world. Uh, There's amazing, starting with 12 men, what 12 men are able to accomplish. So 500,000 members is what's estimated uh, to have been the case. The church faced 10 periods of severe persecution for the first three centuries of its existence in an effort by Satan and the world to erase it from existence. So Satan was determined to try to wipe it off the map. He didn't succeed. Uh, he tried, but he was not successful. Christians patiently faced martyrdom in the face of hatred, torture, and threats. In a book I've heard Brother Lewis mention that I have, and I have not read the whole thing, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Yeah, that's, that's, interesting. I want, that's another one I want to read and haven't done that yet. That's on my reading list. A church historian named Tertullian, uh, and Tertullian lived in the late 100s, early 200s. I've forgotten his exact dates. I should know that, but I've forgotten that. But he wrote, the bread of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And what he was saying, and he was writing to people that were persecuting the church, they need to realize the more that you persecute us, the more it's causing the church to grow. Kind of like in Acts 8 that we talked about. And they were scattered in everywhere preaching the word. So as you uh, kill us, you're causing the church uh, to expand. So the question as we look at this, and I don't know the answer to this, at what point did the church become something different? At what point is it not the church anymore? Uh, at what point did the Catholic Church come into existence? And I don't know that I can give you a, a good answer on this. Uh, I told you before, one of the things that I look at is just the subject of what must I do to be saved, being a Christian, and baptism. Well, how long was that? They're still teaching the, the truth on that. That's one litmus test, but there's other things certainly uh, that you want to take into consideration too. All right. Uh, the fullness of time. Galatians 4, 4 through 5 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might be, uh, receive adoption as sons. So the fullness of time. And I heard uh, Curtis Cates teach a lesson on that. Uh, I still got the cassette somewhere. Uh, in 1995, or nine, uh, must have been 96, that he teach, uh, taught on the subject, the fullness of time. It was a really good lesson. It, he was talking about everything was just right for the church to come into be. And that's what uh, Paul is writing here. So we, uh, again, I won't rehash all that, but we talked about some of this in the past year, but the Babylonians, one of the things that Brother Cates uh, mentioned about in synagogue worship. So the fact that the Jews no longer just come to the temple, but worshiping where they were. That's kind of a feature of the New Testament church. You can establish a con congregation wherever you are. Uh, the Persians brought in the idea of law and order. That even uh, Darius, uh, even Ahasha Eris, as powerful as they were, couldn't change a law. Uh, they wanted to in a couple of cases to, to save Esther and the family and, and to save Daniel from the lion's den and all that, but even they couldn't change the law. So law and order is one thing that was prevalent. The Greeks, the language of the New Testament, I've heard Brother Joel talk about that. The uh, one of the most beautiful, most expressive languages in history, the Koine Greek, that surely after the days of the apostles actually went out of use. That, that part of, of the Greek so that we can, we today in 2023 can look back and see exactly uh, what those words were supposed to mean. In the Roman world, you had the roads uh, that were provided for the uh, preach of the gospel to uh, go around the world. You had a court system and all that. We, we uh, saw references of that uh, Paul being on trial and others being on trial. So they provided some of those things as well. The persecutions. Here's a quote from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, the barbarities uh, exercised on the Christians were such as even excited the commiseration of the Romans themselves. Even the Romans, who uh, the majority were not Christians, felt sorry for the Christians, the things that they endured. Uh, Nero even refined cruelty and contrived all manner of punishments for the Christians that the most infernal imagination could design. But rather increased and diminished the spirit of Christianity, as we talked about Tertullian's quote. Between AD 64 and AD 313, the church faced 10 different periods of persecution in the Roman Empire. 
But when we read, uh, as Dad has pointed out, in um, the book of Acts, in Acts 4, the apostles being questioned uh, by the uh, religious authorities, and in Acts 5, and in Acts 7, and, and all those, those persecutions brought about by Jewish authorities. So they were the ones heading the persecutions. The Romans did not get involved until the time of Nero, after the burning of Rome. My own personal opinion is, and I don't know this was in Nero's mind, but I think he had just acquitted Paul. Uh, a lot of historians say around 80, 63, Paul had been released by Nero. He had turned him loose from prison and allowed him to go, and I happen to believe that. The next year, there was a fire in Rome which burned much of the city, and a lot of historians think Nero himself may have ordered that fire. And so to try to, to get blame uh, away from him, he found the Christians a scapegoat. Maybe he thought about, oh, that guy Paul. So I don't know if that was the case or not. But there's no doubt the, the, the Roman persecution began in AD 64. It didn't stop for almost 250 years. And some of those persecutions were uh, unbelievably uh, strong. Uh, Revelation 2.10, uh, Jesus says to the church there, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. So 10 days, a lot of people think that's a 10-year period of time, a day for a year. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So we are admonished, be, fa be faithful even to the point of death. And some of these early Christians were. Not all, most of them were. So the Nero, the very first one. In AD 64, during the reign of Nero, the church faced its first major persecution headed by the Romans. A fire burned much of Rome that year. And as I said, most historians think that he himself did that. And to pass blame along, he blamed the Christians. During this time, the apostle Paul was beheaded, but not tortured because he was Roman citizen. And Paul's farewell letter is 2 Timothy. Uh, here's some things I found on the internet. You know, the internet is always right. right. Uh, here's some things the internet said. Uh, it says, Christian tradition holds that Paul was beheaded in Rome during the reign of Nero around the mid-60s at the Trey Fontaine Abbey, or the Three Fountains Abbey. Uh, Tertullian, in his prescription against the heretics, AD 200, writes that Paul had a similar death to that of John the Baptist, who was beheaded. And you don't have, it's one of the earliest ones uh, to Paul is written about this time. So there, there's some that will question that to some degree, but most people say that yeah, Paul was beheaded during this time. Eusebius of Caesarea, in his church history, I happen to have a copy of this uh, at home, I testify that Paul was beheaded in Rome and Peter crucified. He wrote that the tombs of these two apostles with their inscriptions were extant in his time. They were still in existence in 8320. I don't know if they are today or not, but as a 320, they were both in existence. And he quotes as, as authority a holy man of the name of Caius. Uh, Lecantius wrote that Nero crucified Peter and slew Paul. He wrote that around AD 318. Uh, Jerome, who translated the Bible into the Latin Vulgate, uh, one of the most famous early translations. He did that around AD 405, I think. But in 392, he stated that Paul was beheaded at Rome. John Chrysostom, who lived from 349 to 407, wrote that Nero knew Paul personally and had him killed. Uh, so, Pitius Severus says Nero killed Peter and Paul, and he was writing the AD 403. So, again, we don't have a. Uh, the Bible itself is silent on this topic, as y'all know. So, the Bible does not re uh, record the death of Paul, just that Paul himself says, I'm about to be killed. In 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, he talks about, I'm about to be poured out. Uh, Peter, in 2 Peter, uh, in chapter 1, about verse 14 to 15, says that my deceased is at hand, basically. So, they both knew they're about to die. The Bible itself does not record the details of how they died. With one exception, Jesus had a prophecy about Peter's death, and we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, Charlie. Charlie, John 7, 19, it says, Did not Moses give ye the law? And yet, none of you keep the law. Why go to you about to kill me. Well, and that's, uh, that's the reason for division in Charlotte, because people won't believe the Bible. So there is some of the Old Testament, the same applies to the New Testament, doesn't it? We can't change uh, what the Bible says. Jesus, you talk about uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, you would enjoy this, and the Lord would too. It's, the book is called Tried by Fire. I got that book. William Bennett wrote the book a uh, number years ago. But he went through kind of like your cataloging from Nero. I can't remember exactly where he started. 
and all the way up to I think I think even the, the Crusades in the 1500s and all you know about what happened to Christians throughout history and everything. But it was I guess similar to the Boxing Book of Martyrs, but uh, it's called Tried by Fire. But uh, William Bennett wrote that book. But uh, you know, many of them were killed by fire, you know, tied to a stake. And right. Yes. Fire. That'd be a terrible day. Yes, sir. Just talking about yes, what sir. they went under, what, you know, right, like right. fire. That, that, the severe persecution that they had going all the way back to 64 right on through. Right. And so forth. And even, even in Paul's, even in Paul's day, what they did to Paul and, and all that on the missionary journeys and, you know, his, his stonings and, right. Uh, he, he just traces the history all the way up, uh, <clears throat> I mean, to 15th or 16th century and maybe even beyond. Okay. And I, you know, I heard a, a, a quote, I read a history book said this, said that, um, more Christians than in the broadest since the term were killed in the 20th century than any other time in history. And part, and part of me that finds that hard to believe, but uh, you know, because we've had such great freedom in our own country. But talking about uh, places in parts of Africa, uh, parts and places like Iraq and Afghanistan, Indonesia, and places like that, that uh, Christians have uh, undergone even in our modern times. Uh, a lot of people that have had. Uh, died for their faith uh, even recently but that's a great point great point uh, Peter's execution and about the same time Peter was crucified uh, about the same time uh, Peter was crucified uh, he did not want to die in the same day as Christ so he asked to be crucified upside down that's uh, when later people wrote that uh, the fact that G of Peter being crucified I do believe and I think that Jesus stated that in John 21 as we we'll look, we'll look at it in a minute his farewell letter is 2 Peter in John 21 17 you remember when Jesus questioned him Peter do you love me do you love me? Do you love me? And that's an interesting uh, study where uh, Jesus would say, do you agape me? And then Peter would say, I phileo you. So he would he wouldn't use the same word that Jesus did. But he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third, day, ter, third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and none will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And most people think he's talking about being crucified. So the fact that uh, Peter being crucified, if that, if uh, that's what the historical records seem to show, that does fit in what Jesus prophesied. You're going to stretch out your hands, and it's going to carry you to where you don't want to go. Here's uh, some of the uh, references here. I don't know that I agree with the date here, but I'll, I'll read this too. Early church tradition says Peter probably died by crucifixion, his arms outstretched as Jesus prophesied. Uh, Margarita Garibucci concludes Peter died on October 13, AD 64, then the festivities on the occasion of Death's Empery of Emperor Nero. Uh, the date I've heard more, yep, I have two, is more like AD 68 or 69. That's what I tend to think uh, more. Of course, Nero himself died in the summer of 68, so his Nero would have been a little bit before, uh, before that. But uh, this took place three months after the disastrous fire that destroyed Rome, for which the Emperor Nero wished to blame Christians. Traditionally, Roman authorities sentenced him to death by crucifixion. According to the apocryphal Acts of Peter, he was crucified head down at his own request, thinking, I'm not worthy to be crucified by someone as Jesus, crucified me upside down. It is traditionally held that he was crucified upside down at his own request, to be said. Tradition holds that he was crucified at the site of Clementine Chapel. And some scholars, as I said, give the year of his death as 80, 68, or 69. 69 might be a little too late because, like I said, Nero himself died the summer of uh, 68. But if it was a, a persecution under Nero, but 80, 68 is, I tend to think, uh, that was about the time that uh, he was uh, crucified at Charlie. Well, Matthew 5, 17 says, thank not. But I can't come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He fulfilled it, didn't he? All 300 plus prophecies of himself. 
I, I can't remember if I've showed y'all this before, but I have y'all forgive me. But here's a, uh, again, a complete list of the apostles. You can look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts, uh, the various list there. Uh, so here's the uh, apostles that are listed there in the various thing. And so some of them uh, go by a little different name. Thaddeus uh, is, is called Judas in Luke and Acts. You can understand why he wouldn't want to be called Judas later on after what Judas Iscariot did, but he's known as Thaddeus later on. Uh, Simon the Zealot and then Judas Iscariot is mentioned in those passages. The fate of the apostles is really intriguing to me. And again, these are historical accounts. It's not in the Bible, except for what's the only apostle that his uh, death is mentioned in the scriptures. James in Acts 12, where uh, he was killed by uh, Herod Agrippa on that occasion. So Peter, the legend is, he was crucified upside down in Rome. Andrew, because he would not submit to the Roman idols, he was crucified by Aegeus, the governor of the Edessenes, and buried in Petrae Petra in Achaia, that would be uh, near Corinth, that area. James was beheaded by Herod Agrippa in Jerusalem. We'll read that in the Bible. John is the only one that is thought to have died in natural causes. And uh, Jesus made a statement when Peter said, well, how about him? He said, well, if he, if he tears, I'll come. What is that to you? And, of course, John is not living now, but maybe he's the only one that was still at the cross. Uh, when Jesus died, so maybe that was part of his reward. I don't know. But he died of natural causes around AD 100. Uh, Philip, a second century tradition believes he died at Heropolis, roughly 100 miles inland of Ephesus. The tradition says he was crucified. So, uh, again, there's diff differing accounts there. Bartholomew, uh, I'm talking about a, a tough way to go uh, here. He was thought to preach in Armenia, and was finally skinned alive, crucified, and beheaded there. So that's that's a, a pretty rough way to uh, to go. <laughs> yes, he, he made somebody mad, didn't he? Uh, Matthew preached in Parthia and Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, he was slain with a halberd in the city of Nadaba in AD 60. And I'll save the rest uh, for next time as we continue this. Thank you for your good attention and good comments.